I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. This episode is brought to you by Fair Kitchens. Learn about the Fair Kitchens code and join the movement at fairkitchens.com. Welcome to Processing, a show about the intersection between food and grief, with your hosts, Sara Tangora and Bobby Conforto. On this show, we're going to really explore where grief and food intersect, how they go hand in hand, different people's experiences with their specific traumas and how food played a part from the beginning to the end of that experience. And how as individuals, we uniquely process life's traumas and losses through either the longing for, the creating of, the avoiding of, the obsessing over, and the eating of food. I remember right after Michael died, I still miss him, but I missed him so badly that night that I stopped at the convenience store on the corner and I bought a container of Ben and Jerry's Cherry Garcia. It's too sweet, you know, it's too everything. And I went home with it and I took it to bed And I thought to myself, gee, so this is my first menage a trois after Michael's death. (laughs) Me, Ben, and Jerry. (laughs) And I ate the entire thing. What do you think your relationship to food was during times of crisis? I think that um, my sister and I use food to reward ourselves. I wish I had something more interesting to say, but definitely like spaghetti and meatballs and chocolate cake. (laughs) (laughs) My mom still can't eat rugula. It makes her too sad. I've also experienced a lot of loss, as has Bobby. And I think we really wanted to find a way where we could like work together. There's something that feels very compelling about doing a project with you, Mom, um, as just kind of a missing piece in life and just something we've always wanted to do but not known quite how. Can't think of anything better myself. I think that, I mean, any conversation about grief, I think, prepares everyone for grief because there are so few conversations about grief. It's why I think that what you guys are doing is so important. (laughs) Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Switching jobs can be a difficult decision fraught with anxiety and what-ifs. There's always danger in leaving what you know for the uncertainty of what may be. And moving across the country and uprooting your life to open a restaurant in New York City is the double whammy of challenging and potentially reckless behavior. Nothing may be more uncertain than arriving in New York City with a dream of success resting on the shoulders of a restaurant. Kopitam, which means coffee shop in a southern Chinese dialect spoken in Malaysia, is an all-day cafe co-owned by today's guest, Moon Lin Tsai. Malaysia is a country located in Southeast Asia, south of Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Its cuisine reflects the diversity of its population and the surrounding islands and countries, so you can find influences from the Malay, Chinese, Indian, Thai, Javanese, and Sumatran cultures. At Kopitiam, you'll find kaya toast made with pandan coconut jam and pandan chicken, which is minced chicken wrapped in pandan leaves. The leaves, which can impart an almondy and milky sweet vanilla-like flavor, is featured in dishes on the menu alongside many dishes containing homemade sambal, an Indonesian-inspired chili sauce typically made from chili peppers, shrimp paste, garlic, ginger, scallion, palm sugar, and lime juice. This sambal is featured on the menu in the nasi lemak, the national dish of Malaysia, coconut rice, sambal, fried anchovies, peanuts, cucumbers, and a hard-boiled egg. Moon Lin was born in the, into the restaurant industry, but like many children of restaurant owners and workers, she wanted to forge her own path. But as we know now, she was pulled back in. She ended up working in the Bay Area and L.A. in restaurants before switching coasts in 2018, partnering with Chef Kyo Pang to invigorate the new larger version of Kopitiam. The restaurant, which is located on the Lower East Side, received a James Beard semifinalist nomination for Chef Pang, 
a 2018 critic pick from Pete Wells in the New York Times where he called it almost unfailingly terrific. And in 2019, the restaurant was named a Bon Appetit magazine hot 10 restaurant. You're on a good run here. Thank you. Today we'll be talking about growing up in restaurants, choosing a business partner, running a very hot restaurant, and the cu- cuisine of Copatiem. Moon Lin, welcome to the program. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Eli. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today, but I want to start in the beginning in your childhood. You were born in San Diego, right? I was, yeah, in uh, Carlsbad, California. So it's 45 minutes from downtown San Diego and about two hours south from L.A. And so being a SoCal kid, um, what was your childhood like? Were you a beach kid? Were you an indoor kid? I know that your parents were involved in the food industry. So what did they do and what was that like growing up in, in Southern California? You know, growing up, being in California, definitely a lot of outdoors. Played a lot of sports. Sports were a really big part of me growing up. Um, I did basketball all throughout elementary school, high school. Uh, definitely a beach kid. You know, we would ditch school. I remember ditching class to go surfing or just going to the beach to decompress a little bit. Tacos all the time. You know, we had so much space there. So there was a lot of time for the outdoors, you know, hiking, just hanging out with friends. It was a very sleepy town. It wasn't a big city by any means. It was very like suburbia. Um, So growing up, it was more so just hanging out with friends, going to, you know, the local eats, going to my dad's restaurant a lot. And so where are your parents from and what was your dad's restaurant called? What was it, What kind of food did it serve? So my parents are both from Taiwan. My dad's from Taipei, so that's the capital of Taiwan. My mom's from a more quiet town in south of Taiwan called Pingtung. And they met in Taiwan. My dad was living in Hawaii at the time. And he went back to Taiwan on a trip. They met there, got married, then flew over to L.A. where they first started the first business. Then they drove and moved down to San Diego and opened a restaurant down there. And it was called Chin Sichuan. It was a collaboration between my dad and his uncle, or my uncle. And so when you were a kid, did you kind of like after school, did you pop by the restaurant and like do your homework at a table? Were you required to, you know? you know, you know. (laughs) Like, did you have to bust tables? I mean, I've heard of kind of this, like, there is sort of a immigrant first generation restaurant story and yeah. I want to know if yours follows sort of a similar trajectory which is like you had to work a lot <laughs> oh yeah it was I mean I didn't know it was work I thought I was just having fun you know I would go after school and, and I would hang out with the chefs who were on their break rolling egg rolls and I would do that uh, I remember one of the oldest memories was organizing I think not knowing it was work but hey I was being put to work was filing a lot of filing so I would just see all these different colors of paper. My dad made me organize it by color. Then I would have to go through and organize it by date. So lucky him. (laughs) So I spent a lot of time doing that. And then as I got older, transitioned into helping out at the corporate office, doing more, you know, branding, emails, like corresponding with vendors. And then after when I got, I think it was early high school is when I started transitioning into the actual restaurant. So that went from everything. It was polishing silverware, inventory, doing all the tasks that you just have to do to help out the family. You know, it didn't matter what it was. It's, you started off as like a bookkeeper, then you did accounts payable and then you got got like demoted to server. Yes, exactly. (laughs) They were like, you're old enough to interact with customers. So now you're going to have to work tables. Um, And so it seems like you enjoyed it and didn't do it reluctantly was there a kind of a a push and pull a tug ever between okay this is my family's restaurant and I know I have to be here but I I don't want to be here or were you always all the time okay so growing up I knew that the restaurant was there and for me it was just always something I saw my parents do and my dad was never home you know the family we weren't like a close family so it was more so my mom my brother and I My dad would come home every so often. He would be working from 8 to midnight, past midnight. And I was like, I don't want to get into that. I don't want that to be my life in the future. But as I got older, I was like, okay, what do I want to do? So I wanted to be like either a therapist, graphic design, or an art teacher. So I went to college trying to get into education. But then my dad, 
he really, we're estranged now. So he would use a lot of different guilting methods, like, hey, I'm dying soon. Because he had all these like heart and health issues where he's like, I built this up for the past 20 so years. How are you just going to let this fail? So there was a lot of pressure on that. And then thinking that he was always going to die, that added on to it. And then the last straw came when he's like, if you want to go into any of these other fields, then I'm not going to pay for your tuition. So I was like, okay. So then I went into business, tried to do as many odd jobs. I was a extra in the Veronica Mars show through college. I was a Mandarin translator for a hospital. So I tried to do as much as I could outside, but it just kept coming back. I don't know if it was, you know, the filial duty growing up as a Taiwanese immigrant where you do see your parents working so hard and building up this company and you just didn't want to fail. But I loved interacting with the guests, but the way my dad ran the business was not something I would ever want to be a part of. It was very tyrannical. So I know it's obviously difficult to talk about, but what is the kind of state of the business now? And is any of your family involved in it at all? So my dad and my mom, they went through a really rough divorce. Um, my father has a lot of mental illness, so he kind of, I don't want to say ruin it, but he pretty much ruined the business between him and my uncle. I don't know too much of what's going on with that right now, but I'm just really glad I didn't become a part of it because it would have just been a lot of heartache. It's actually interesting that you have gone into the industry because it seems to be a point of tension and kind of sadness from your childhood to a certain extent. And yet this is the path that you've forged. So there's got to be a bunch of elements of the business that propelled you to, to move forward. Can you speak a little bit about the positive points that made it so that you didn't become an art teacher or a therapist and now you are in fact co-owner of a restaurant? What, what are those elements that you just couldn't leave? Yeah, so it actually happened when I moved to Orange County and I was living with four dudes and they loved beer and I grew up in San Diego and that was the mecca of beer. And so we would drink all the time and then we would discuss it and then we would go to the local farmer's market and we would make these dinners to pair with the, with the beer. And then two of them decided they wanted to open a craft beer bar up in the Bay Area. And so I was like, I didn't really want to get back into that industry, but being with friends, being surrounded by people I felt that cared for me and I could really bond with, we all moved up there, we opened this bar, and just the education, the talking, learning, I think it encompassed everything I wanted to do, whether it be a teacher or graphic design or whatnot. So this, re this beer bar allowed me to touch on all those things that I wanted to do, because there were no limits. It was like a free-for-all where we're like, okay, what part do you want to do? What part do you want to do? What part do you like? And everyone had their own skill set, so everyone was able to touch on that. So this is original gravity, right? This is original gravity. So the cool thing about starting a business is that you have to do, you get to do everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. The bad part of the business is that you I have, love it. You have to That's do That's my favorite part of the first like <laughs> pre-opening to maybe the first six, eight months where everything is just a clusterfuck and you don't know what's going on. There's, yes. there's just an endless list either mm -hmm. on an app or on a page mm -hmm. or on a piece of drywall and it's like everything that needs to oh, get yeah. done and someone has to do it and it seems like you took on a lot of those tasks were you doing it as a favor to them did you come on board as a full-time staffer did you have a, a set position at original gravity or was it so loose that it didn't really work that way it was so loose i was just really grateful for the opportunity to do something else you know um at that time i was going into an interview to be a photo editor in la um, that didn't pan out. And so when this opportunity came, I was like, you know what? Why not? Let's change. I always, I've always wanted to live in the Bay Area. This will get me close enough. It was about 30 minutes south from San Francisco. Um, I didn't have a actual title, but I was there full time. I did transition more as a general manager for there as well. And so how was it received? It opened and now there's there's always been a huge love of craft beer and mm -hmm. there is now thousands of breweries oh, yeah. across the United States. You can review them on mm -hmm. tons of websites and beer culture has been, I would say elevated. Um, it's 
it's not quite at wine level, but it is definitely approaching wine level in the way yeah. that people discuss beer from a very heady standpoint, mm-hmm. right? So what was the spot upon opening? How was its reception? How did people treat it? And and what did you learn from that experience? Oh, it was fantastic. So we were the first craft beer bar in San Jose. And because of the proximity to Google, Apple, to Napa Valley, um, a lot of these other breweries up in San Francisco, it was great. It was a place for beer connoisseurs to kind of get together, hang out, and discuss beer. We had a rotating... At that time, it was... I think it was 20 taps. I think now they have close to 30 or 40 taps. And so it's constant learning. The brewers would come in. They would explain their product. Um, I learned about the Cicerone program. So I started, I got the level one. I was in training for level two. Um, I think I'm such a big fan of beverages, whether it be cocktails, teas, beer. And growing up in San Diego, it was so exciting to see the growth of it. You know, back then it was already on the incline, but then it just exploded. The scene was, it's, it's been nuts. So I love... My girlfriend and I, we used to travel all the time to breweries that don't distribute, and we would just haul all these beers in the in the trunk of the car and just drive back, and yeah, the it was so can, much fun. The can release day gives kind of a, uh, it's almost like a musical concert kind of yeah, vibe, like yeah. people are waiting in line for the doors to open, and there's a camaraderie. It's akin to like waiting to see like Star Wars or going to see your favorite band yeah. or something. It's the the culture and the community surrounding it bonds everyone together. It's a great right? community too. Everyone that I've met personally, they're so nice and so giving. Um, yeah, I remember waiting in line for, I think it was about two and a half hours at the brewery in Anaheim. I forget which release it was. And then also at Stone Brewery when they were releasing... I forget which one, but there was a lot of times waiting in line, but the line was the best part of it. You know, you get to chat with all these fellow beer lovers. But then after that, a couple of years ago, I developed the gluten allergy. So I haven't been able to enjoy and drink beer as much as I used to. That so sad. That is so very, sad. That is very sad. You guys I have to switch over to some other spirit now, right? Is uh, there anything y- that you can drink? You know, I love tea. Okay. So I've been getting really into teas. I do cheat once in a while. Um, There's a lot of really great gluten-free beers coming out on the market, so that's been really fun. That's cool. Is it? We can talk a little bit about like beverages and things at at the restaurant in in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk about moving down to LA and Pine and Crane. Yeah. So now it's 2015, and uh, you leave the Bay, and there is an opportunity that presents itself, um, and it's a Taiwanese restaurant. Yep. And can you talk a little bit about how you met the owner and the, the woman that started Pine and Crane? And then how did that project kind of develop? Yeah, so that was very kismet as well. I got a call one day at Original Gravity from my mom. And she's like, hey, my friend is opening up a Chinese restaurant in L.A. And she has some questions. So I'm like, OK. So then I get this really long text. And it was formulated so well where I was like, wow, like which friend of my mom? But it turns out. It was actually my mom's friend's daughter, Vivian, who just signed a lease in Silver Lake. And she was in the process of opening. And then she needed some help. So her mom was calling my mom at like 4 or 5 in the morning, asking if my brother would be interested. But my brother's not in the restaurant industry at all. So she's like, well, my daughter is up in San Jose doing that. So Vivian texted me. We got to talking. And I was like, this is amazing. Your family has your their own farm in Bakersfield where they make all the pro well, they grow all the produce and it was a take on Taiwanese cuisine that I've never seen where it's more fresh, literally from the farm to the table. And she asked if I'd be interested and I was. So within a month I moved down from original gravity and helped her with that. And for people that aren't that familiar with LA, I I would say in 2005, 2008, people really started moving to Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. And then a couple years after that, there was like, an explosion oh, of Silver Lake, and now it is one of the hottest neighborhoods probably in the United States. People mm-hmm. move to California to move to Silver Lake. You're right down the street from mm-hmm. like an intelligentsia yeah, yeah. at Pine and Crane. But like when you move down to LA, even though you're from San Diego, like how familiar were you with Not Silver Lake? And did you kind of know 
did you have an inkling in your head like, oh, we're opening up on Griffith Park Boulevard and Silver Lake and like this is a really cool area or did did the project just as its own entity kind of appeal to you? I had no idea about the Silver Lake area. I wasn't a big fan of L.A. initially. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to visit all the time with friends, you know, when you're younger, you're clubbing, whatnot. And I was like, "Uh, it's not my thing. When I got to Silver Lake, I still didn't really understand the area. I just knew it was very colorful. There was really a lot of talent there and there was a lot more space. And I mean, the housings were really cute. It wasn't what you expect L.A. to be like so packed and jam packed with people. Um, When I was hanging out there for about a week, neighbors would just start walking by and just introduce themselves, hang out. I was like, this is awesome. This is such like a fun community vibe. So I was really excited for that. And so you had another opportunity with Pine and Crane to utilize your skill set in conceptualizing and opening a spot, right? You were sort of a like a right-hand person in a co-collaboration mm-hmm. sense. You weren't an owner of the restaurant, mm-hmm. but you did kind of help through that entire process. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you speak to the first couple months prior to opening and then also once it got open, like how did your role there morph a little bit? Yeah, it was was different every single day. It was like today, oh, we got to go pick out the fabric for the boots or we got to learn how to burn these wood paneling so that it would match this uh, or how do we design this and then to a little more operational hiring, you know, how much, how many staff do we need to start up with, then to the back of house where we're both learning how to cook all the foods. So every day was different. Um, It just really depended on what we need to do that day. And after we opened, I transitioned more into a GM role. So that was, I was there every day from 10 a.m. to about 11.30 p.m., just tagging in whenever we needed to tag in, uh, working the floor, doing the finances, tagging in, expediting is all over. And how was it received? You know, it, it opened and, uh, did it meet your expectations? Did it meet guests expectations for what it was? Oh yeah. So we opened Pine and Crane thinking it was just going to be a neighborhood coffee shop. We'll have some small bites. We set it up as a very fast casual. We didn't anticipate how well received it would have been. And I think what really touched me was a bunch of Taiwanese, you know, second generation or first generation Taiwanese kids like myself would come in and they would be so proud of it. Then they would bring their parents, their grandparents, and they all loved it. And I think that was the biggest feedback. And you, you just can't get any better than that. When you opened up a restaurant in Los Angeles, so close, drivable from San Diego, uh, what did it mean to you that your mom could drive up and maybe see a spot that literally you had built with your own hands after seeing what your parents had done for Mm -hmm. so many years at their restaurant? What, well, how did that make you feel? It was amazing. At the time, I think it was... My parents were going through the divorce, so I think she was splitting time between Taiwan and San Diego. So she actually wasn't there for the grand opening, but I remember when she was visiting from Taiwan maybe a year after, she was blown away by seeing what it used to be, you know, just a blank shell. It was actually two spaces that we turned into one space, the construction, and she was so proud to see how many people were going and enjoying, you know, very traditional Taiwanese cuisine, like the three cup chicken, the oyster omelet, all the little cold salads that you wouldn't think would fare well with a Western palate, the woodier salad. Um, I know a lot of people were a little taken aback about the texture of it. And then we had the pig ear salad that resonated well too. So I think for her, it was more, she was so proud that the cuisine that she grew up eating was being so well received by like the masses now. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to start talking about Uh, the move to New York and your current project. This episode is brought to you by Fair Kitchens. The food service industry faces a challenge. More people are eating out, yet restaurants are losing talent. Why is this? 
Research by Fair Kitchens reveals a serious well-being issue within professional kitchens. 74% of chefs are sleep-deprived to the point of exhaustion. 63% of chefs feel depressed. And more than half feel pushed to the breaking point. This can't be ignored. Fair Kitchens is a movement based on the belief that a positive kitchen culture makes for a healthier business. By taking the pledge to be a Fair Kitchen, they'll provide you with free information, tools, and resources to help you take action towards making your restaurant more stable, productive, and happy, which positively affects the guest experience. It's time to act now. Learn about the Fair Kitchens code and join the movement at fairkitchens.com. Welcome back to the line here on Heritage Radio. My guest today is Moonlin Sai. She was born in San Diego and worked in the Bay Area and Los Angeles before moving to New York to join up with the Project Copatiam, which has reopened in a much larger space on the Lower East Side and has received critical acclaim. The New York Times gave it a critic's pick and called it almost unfailingly terrific, and Bon Appetit magazine chose it as a hot 10 restaurant in 2019. But when you were here in New York City, walking around with your girlfriend, yelping and Googling (laughs) Malaysian restaurants, looking for somewhere to just get lunch... I imagine you could have never have guessed that you would be involved in the project that you would Yelp for lunch. Um, So before the break, we were talking about you being at Pine and Crane, and it seemed like there was uh, a lot of great success that Mm -hmm. was happening, and it seems like you were really liking it and you were Mm -hmm. feeling fulfilled. How did New York come to be at all when you had a project in Los Angeles? I think I get a little tired around the two-year mark. So the two-year mark hit right before I was turning 30. So at that time, it was either I can keep staying with this project where I felt like I already reached my max potential or really finally do my work on my own project. So after Pine and Crane and right before I turned 30, (coughs) my girlfriend and I, we took a three-month backpacking trip around Southeast Asia where we visited her grandpa who was in Penang, Malaysia. And then when we moved to New York, not moved to New York, but when we visited New York, uh, her family in New York, we were yelping. We found the old Kopitiam, stum- went there, and we were blown away by this hole in the wall. She was cranking out all these really delicious foods that you would find in Malaysia that we had, and it was so good. I remember saying to my girlfriend, she was like, man, if she ever opened up in L.A., I would love to be involved or partner up with her somehow. And then fast forward, I think three years later, just insane. What's so amazing about being in the industry and and going out to eat is that your brain, like the gears are always turning, right? Mm-hmm. And you were so captivated by her cuisine that you immediately thought to yourself, this is someone that I would potentially want to work with. Like you saw something there. Mm-hmm. You, you saw sparks that immediately resonated with you and you thought this could be something that I could mm-hmm. be involved in, right? Of course. And, uh, and I think anyone who's ever worked in a restaurant that they really believe in or they've gone out to a restaurant where they're pleasantly or shockingly surprised yeah. knows what that feeling is like, that little tingling when you say to yourself, something is, is happening yeah, like, here. <gasps> and, and so you you taste the food and then what are the next steps after that? Like how do you engage in the discussion with someone of, uh, well – I like what you're doing and maybe we should become (laughs) partners, you know, like there's gotta be like 10 steps in the middle of those two points. So what was kind of the next thing that you did after that? Well, it was more than 10 steps. It was about (laughs) a three year gap. (laughs) So during that time I was looking for my own space in LA that wasn't panning out. We flew back to New York, but then found out Kia was closing in two weeks. And at that time she had an Indiegogo campaign. It didn't reach the goal she was hoping for. And Yin's mom who was there, I was like, oh my goodness, do you think you would want to partner with her? And I was like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I just worked so hard for this money that I finally set aside that I was able to keep. I don't know if I want to work with or for somebody else again. But then after Kyo and I got to talking, we are like, oh man, our skill sets, they overlap and they complement each other so well. I've always wanted to move to New York. I just didn't think it would happen so quickly. Um, 
as we got to talking, we're like, this could work. So after I left for San Diego, we signed a partnership agreement. We signed a lease agreement because she already had a space in mind, which was amazing. It was literally around the corner in a much bigger space. The old space sat four. Now we see about 42. And within four months, I moved, or my girlfriend and I, we did the cross-country road trip from San Diego over to New York. It's It can't be glossed over that this is sort of the even though it was a three-year gap, this is a speed courtship. Uh, oh, which yeah, is, the fastest relationship ever. Which is that um, your girlfriend's mom plants the idea, mm-hmm. and you had tasted the food three years earlier, mm-hmm. and then you and Chef Kyo, you hung out for several days in a row to kind of get to know each other mm-hmm. and feel whether this could work, speed right? Speed dating. So what was that like? You basically, you said let's see if we vibe as just two people and then we'll take it from there exactly so i do have social anxiety so the thought of hanging out with someone for four days straight that i didn't know was really scary to me and so i think that was a that's when i was like okay this could work is when we met up the next day it was very romantic over coffee we both got lattes and we're like ah okay we sat down and we just got to talking about what she wanted Kopitiam to grow into, what her hopes were, what I as a restaurateur or hope to be a restaurateur find enjoyment in this area. And we just realized, you know, we can actually work together and it would grow this brand so much farther than just one of us doing both. And Kopitiam in its in its small location, it had a really wonderful following. It did, People yeah. were People were excited about the food that was coming out with it, and they were also – they were bringing – it wasn't just like a neighborhood spot, Mm -hmm. right, that that people that had grown up eating that food would eat. It also was – it was a spot that people that – you know, New York has has folks that just seek out Mm -hmm. an interesting, unique Mm hole-in-the-wall spot, and um, Hungry City had written about it in 2015 in in the New York Times. So there had been like some inklings Mm -hmm. of – of what was going on there, but to make that big step to move it to the new location, that really played into your strengths, right? Of like opening a restaurant from, from start to finish. So were you selling yourself or was she selling herself? What was the dynamic like in this, uh, partnership discussion? Yeah. So funny enough, there wasn't really selling. It was more so realizing that, Hey, if I if we work together, I can focus on what I'm good at doing. So for me, I'm like, oh, I would love to be involved in the, you know, the setup of the front, all the logistical side, and please just if you can just make the menu as good as it is now, it's going to be amazing. So I think the respect of respecting each other's uh, spaces, I think that was what helped grow this restaurant so fast in the new iteration. There's definitely no specific way that you can find a partner. Some people partner with their siblings or, mm-hmm. or their relatives, and some people have placed ads on mm-hmm. Craigslist. Like yeah. you hear tons of different stories mm-hmm. and all these permutations of how it can work. Um, when you got down to like the nitty gritty of mm-hmm. it and, and building a true partner relationship, did you? make a partner agreement, a a Mm -hmm. contract? Did you talk to a lawyer about it? Uh, You know, there's, it's, it's a wonderful story. And I like sharing the origin Mm -hmm. story of my brother and I figuring out our idea. But then when it comes down to it, this is a business, right? Oh, for sure. And you need to protect yourself and protect the business. So what concrete steps did you take to uh, make sure that your investment and your right. mental state were, were protected. So I think what I've learned through my journey is always have a legal team. Uh, with Pine and Crane, it was more so. Pine and Crane, original gravity, it was, oh, these are my friends. This is great. It'll be fine. You know, We'll just talk about it, and it'll be fine. Um, definitely went through some trials and tribulations with that. With Kopi Tia, I was like, uh-uh, I'm not having that again. So I brought in a lawyer. We, I think that was the biggest part of this partnership was going back and forth on the partnership agreement, which ended up being about 50 pages long. So we covered everything from, from now into the future, but what if you want to expand into another continent and this person doesn't want to? It's just forcing 
even the most minuscule things that you don't think would ever come up, just having it in there. And also realizing that, hey, if this person really wants to work with you, you will work on that agreement together. You'll have differences, but you'll come up with a middle ground. So we spent about a good three weeks on that partnership agreement, finally got it done, then onto the leasing agreement, which was a little difficult because I was in San Diego. Then they needed all this like contracts and things from the person in New York, permitting, whatnot. So going through that process was very difficult, but we're lucky we got all squared away. Um, poor Kyo had to deal with a lot of it herself because she was over here. But then when I got over, then we were able to kind of double time and then just tackle on all these things that we had to do. I think for anyone listening that is exploring their own potential project or is in the already stages of opening, we as people that co-own a business with someone, I don't think we can emphasize this enough that uh, you can get the food right and you can figure out how the walls look and you can make everything look beautiful. But really when it comes down to it, the leasing agreement and Mm -hmm. the partner agreement, Mm -hmm. those are as important, if not more important, because you never know what's going to happen mm-hmm. in two, five years. You know, you don't know if you're going to have the opportunity to open a hundred locations yeah. or if, you know, on the flip side, something terrible is going to happen and you have to uh, yeah. deal with, with that. So, um, hope for the best plan for the worst. Right? Yeah. And so when you are, when you are going through that process, which, and I remember that process, the intensity level of it it made me question the decisions, right? You just, oh, yeah. it's so much bigger than just, oh, we're opening up a restaurant. Mm-hmm. That seems fun. Yeah. You know, let's cook some food and people will come. Were there parts of you when you were back on the West Coast that you were really feeling like, oh my God, this is this is so real now? Yes, it was after the partnership agreement was signed when we were segueing into the leasing agreement where I was like, wait, again, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to move? And again, invest in someone else's idea. And I had cold feet for a little bit, but I was like, you know, just just roll with it. It's been past two years in LA. It hasn't really panned out. You might as well give yourself a chance. So then moving here, thankfully, crossing fingers, it went for the better. So did you have to raise, I know that you said that um, that Chef Kyo did a, a fundraising campaign mm-hmm. and it had not met her specific goals and you had been saving. So did you have to raise additional funds beyond what you and, and Chef Kyo could bring to the project? And if yes, what was that process like? Uh, we're very lucky where we didn't have to. So I was able to fund it um, fully. And so once you raise the the money internally and you have the space, Mm -hmm. how long was it from when you signed all the paperwork to when you threw the doors open at the new version of it? It was fast. So in LA, it was about six to eight months. And I thought it was going to be that long. Kia was like, no, we'll be done in about three or four. I'm like, there's no way. This used to be an old optometrist office. There were no bathrooms. There's no piping. We were done in about three and a half months. And you're talking about gas and plumbing? So we don't have gas. You ha- you cook all out induction mm-hmm. burners. Okay, and that's a good way to kind of move uh, along the process, although it, it can hamper the... Oh, they break all the time. Yeah. Like that. Oh, it's terrible. And, and, but it is one of those things where if you're looking to do a restaurant project and you don't have a million dollar mm-hmm. budget to throw in a hood mm-hmm. and hook up gas lines and deal with the permitting and the headache Mm -hmm. of the city, that's one way to kind of... Yeah, for sure. And I wouldn't even call that cutting corners. It's just that's a cost evaluation, right? It's more like, are are we doing the $200 tables or Mm the $150 tables, right? What other choices did you have to make in the process of opening, especially because you were literally, you are using your own money. You were counting your own dollars. It was scary because across the street, it was a pizza shop and they were actually in construction before we even signed. And they didn't open up until about two months ago. And they were waiting on gas. So there were just so many things about New York that I wasn't familiar with. Because in LA, things are fairly smooth. In New York, you have all these old buildings. Um, when we set up the new Kopitiam, again, like Pine and Crane, we didn't anticipate it to be a full-on restaurant. It was actually supposed to be a coffee shop where the menu was 80% drinks, 20% food. And then as we slowly started to grow, we started incorporating more and more food items where the kitchen build-out was not suited for that. I initially had this 
amazing office that I built out into the kitchen. I never got to use it. Within like three months, we had to tear it all down and it's now storage. Um, so just the setup where it's now all food, 20% drinks. So that was a little tricky to maneuver because we only have a six burner and the space in our kitchen is about maybe 100 square feet. So just figuring out how to go about this playing Tetris all the time and figuring out how to make everything go as smooth as possible from the, how do you manage the line? How do you manage the flow? It's always learning. It's such a small kitchen and relative to the amount of seats that you have and then to layer something on top of that as well, you're an all day restaurant, right? So mm-hmm. your hours of operation, you have breakfast and then at what, 1030 or 11, you lunch menu clicks in. So you add items, right? So actually we segue where it's the full menu now all day. Oh, so you just really want to yeah. kill the kitchen completely. I know, you're, right? When we first opened, we were shooting for our 7 a.m. opening till 2 a.m. So Kia and I, we did that for a couple of the days and we were dead. Like we couldn't do it anymore. Her feet were bloated. We had to soak it in those five gallon containers with Epsom salt. My back, I herniated my spine the third time. And we're like, this is not sustainable. So we scaled back. We, then we opened from 7 a.m. till 11. Still couldn't manage and now we're at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., which is a lot more manageable and close on Wednesdays. Okay, so still 11 hours, though. Still, yes. Um, 11 hours yes. of operation, which means that um, folks are in there a couple hours early and out mm-hmm. a couple hours later. And you've got that, that small space, and it's a pretty large menu. It um, is. Was there a discussion between you two about... Well, obviously you started off and there was, it was going to be a bit of a different model, but like, how did you continually add and fold in more menu items? Was it that old customers were coming and saying like, oh, I want this, you used to have that? Or was it just ambition overcame the, the space constraints? I think it was a little bit of everything where it's like, okay, how can we push ourselves to cook more in the space what ingredients can overlap with the other ones how do we store everything and I think especially when guests from Malaysia they come they're like oh my god I haven't had panmi in over 10 years but do you do this and then Kiyo she's really creative and she loves to challenge herself so she's like well we can do that so then it became people who came in and they were requesting we're like okay we can do that so we started adding and adding where I think now we have about 40 items on the menu it is definitely not a snack shop or a it's, coffee shop. No, but it's it not. It is a full-on restaurant. And that actually speaks to some of the uh, press and acclaim that you've received over the last uh, year or so, which is this place was existing and it was serving – uh, really great food by all accounts, but it only had four seats and it had just kind of a different – people were – they had to interact with it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And now that uh, it's a sit down restaurant and there is an element of service that's been elevated, we can say, Mm -hmm. or changed based on the fact that you have seats. um, Do you think that contributed a lot to the, the press? Do you think that it was about the space being different? Do you think it was something that you may have brought to the table from a service or forward facing perspective? Because, um, some people would say like this place opened at 2015 and, and now it's like the acclaim is catching up. So why do you think that that, that happened? I think it was a myriad of everything. I think the space being physically bigger allows for more people to come through. I think also because the space is bigger and Kyo has more fun in the kitchen now with an actual kitchen, she's ex- She's able to experiment with more dishes she's always been wanting to cook. Her parents own Kopi Tams in Malaysia. So her parents would call and be like, hey, are you going to serve this? Let's ship this over for you. And so I think it's always just constantly changing. And then I think with our front of house being mainly high schoolers and then the draw and giving back to the community, I think it's been able to kind of grow and bring more awareness to that, to the people in our neighborhood. And so we get a lot of different types of people coming in you know you got your Chinatown grandmas parents but then you also since we're in the lower east side we have a lot of young urban professionals that come in and hang out so especially New York being a hub for like the writing media I think that helped garnish a lot of attention we spoke of, you just touched on this and we spoke about this before we went on air but your staff is really young you had a hard time uh connecting with uh sort of 
New York pro servers, which is like someone who's mm-hmm. worked in a restaurant for a couple years. So how did you, you have a really interesting way of, of uh, sort of circumventing or fixing this problem, which is that you couldn't get servers. So what did you do exactly? Yeah, it was rough. We had about two weeks till opening. The only people who were coming through were high school kids who just graduated high school, leaving for college in about two and a half months. And they were asking if we would be interested in hiring them for a part-time summer job. And I was like, no, no, because then by the time you're gone, I'm going to have to redo this whole training situation all over again. But, you know, when push comes to shove, you just got to make do. So we brought on, I think it was seven to eight high school graduates. And they were amazing. They worked so hard. They always wanted more shifts. I think it really helped that most of them were bilingual. So they were able to communicate with, you know, the people living in Chinatown and then also with the Lower East Side. And they were just so proud of the space in their neighborhood where, I mean, along with gentrification, you just got to, our thing is gentrification, it's inevitable. But how do we take our space but grow and respect the community and give back to the community that we're part of? And for us, it's still keeping our costs low so that everyone can afford it just because the space is a little more thought out and decorated doesn't mean it has to be a little like really pretentious you know um grandparents who come in they can still order and feel very comfortable as the next person who comes in when you think about your your day-to-day in this restaurant and you think well i moved all the way across the united states to kind of do this are you giving yourself any time right now to kind of reflect on your um, successes and the fact that it seems to be working or is that not your personality and are you kind of uh, looking forward and, and tweaking? I'm always looking for holes and how to fix things. Um, I haven't, ha- I feel like we're almost hitting the two year and that's kind of when the downtime I feel like is slowly going to come in and I'm, I'm going to have a little more time to reflect on that. I'm just so blown away about how well received and really touched by how much people love Kopitiam. But I think for me, it's more so, okay, how do we charge for it? Like, what's the next step? What's the next project? I don't like sitting down and having downtime. Like every once in a while, I'll sit down and read a book. But I think for now, when you have that adrenaline or that momentum, you just keep going. I know that no days are alike, but as a owner that also handles so many other pieces, you are the active general manager, you do the social media, and you're, you have hands in, in everything. Can you just run through what a normal day may look like for you? I think it's always really interesting for folks that that are looking to take the step that you took, which mm-hmm. is, I have a project in my head, and you know what, I'm going to do that project. Um, they want to know what your life and day is like. Yeah, so every day I wake up around 6.30, I'll make my breakfast, and then I go open the shop by about 7.45. When I do all the financials, I that's the time where I kind of go through the social media, respond to what needs to be responded to, check my emails, see if we have any catering orders coming in, update the staff and the team on catering orders. Uh, then a little halfway through the day, I'll wean off a little bit where it'll be running physical errands, like going to the restaurant supply store or seeing what needs to be done and then tagging in and out of the kitchen if necessary. Right now, because we don't have a GM, and it's not that I don't want one. I would love to have one. It's just where we are right now, it's very transitional. So it's been hard. But we do have a guy on the team, Kai. He, We hired him when we first opened knowing that he wanted to go to culinary school, he wanted to have his own bakery one day. So instead of having a GM full-time, I invited him over and was like, hey, if you want to learn, I'm here to teach you. So kind of more like a mentorship. So he's there two days a week. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I have a little more leeway, time off. So is that today? I think that's today. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you were able yes. to escape and record this. Yeah. Um, and I know that you said earlier that you know you get kind of restless at the two hour two year um Mm -hmm. mark and you're coming up on that right and so um what are you doing now that this is your full project like what are you actually what steps are you taking to kind of mitigate you either 
taking a step back and and maybe freaking out that it's the two year mark mm-hmm. or like digging in totally crazy because it's the two year mark. Like, how are you going to find balance um, and hopefully center yourself for the next two, five years, whatever might come after that? I think it's been balancing both. So I'm learning to let go. So now I, on the weekends when it's usually the most busy, I've been physically barring myself from going into the restaurant during the rush times just to see how the team is holding up. And they're doing great. So I'm like, oh, it's me. You know, I need to learn to let go a little bit. So I have been where now I'm focusing on more. So, you know, what are some side ideas in terms of expansion with Kia? We're like, you know, what are some things we want to do? I, my girlfriend, she signed me up for a private singing class just because she wants me to do something outside of my norm. So I think for 2020, it's more so throwing myself in things and learning things that I usually wouldn't do and also brainstorming, you know, what do I want to do next with Kopitiam and also outside of Kopitiam. I wonder for you when you do take those steps away and you're not at the restaurant and everything is running smoothly, there's got to be that checklist that's running in the back of your mind, which is always as an owner, you always think to yourself, well, if there's three hours that I don't need to be working the floor, that, that should be the three hours that I, I don't know, fix the X mm-hmm. that I keep walking by. And I'm like, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Right. Oh, yeah. Everyone, every owner has like the improvements and upgrades list mm-hmm. that they, that they need to do. So beyond that list, I want to know, what do you think is the largest challenge that you face as, uh, as a restaurant owner in New York city? I think the largest challenge is you know with the rising minimum wage and having so we have 14 14 staff up front six in the kitchen I think the challenge is how can we sustain this business so we can keep providing and even though we're operating at bare minimum how can we sustain this we still have three years left on the lease (laughs) how how do we make sure we're gonna be okay for the next three years so that's always you know something on my end and then also with construction you know things are leaking downstairs it's like oh there's the checklist is never ending um I think the challenges they always just pop up randomly where it's like okay we have catering but how can I grow this side and not having to be so involved with everything you know how can I have this restaurant self-sustaining so both Q and I don't have to be here all the time so I think that's the ultimate goal is is being self-sustaining at the same time, where do we see ourselves in the next couple years? Moon Lin, thanks so much for being here. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun. Uh, I would love for you to shout out the, the website and the address of the restaurant so people can figure out how they can find you and also just um, the hours again so that people know when you're open. Yeah, we're located right off the East Broadway F train stop, and the address is 151 East Broadway, and it's www. Kopitiam, K-O-P-I-T-I-A-M, N-Y-C dot com. And that's the same through all channels of social media. Great. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Go check out the restaurant and find all the episodes of The Line. We've got 94 other episodes online at heritageradionetwork.org or wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, and on Spotify. We'll be back next Tuesday for a new episode of The Line at 11 a.m. here on Heritage Radio. The Line is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners just like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hi. 
I'm Sherry Bayer, the host of All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm thrilled to let you know about HOST, Summit Plus Social, a new conference for and about the hospitality industry, taking place Monday, January 27, 2020, at the William Vale in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York City. Based on my All in the Industry show, HOST, which stands for Hospitality Operations, Services, and Technology, will bring behind-the-scenes talent in hospitality to the forefront in a live format, featuring guests from some of my most popular episodes, including Drew Niporent, Rita Jamey, Crystal Mobiani, J.J. Johnson, and Jeff Gordonier. Our event will include intimate panels, one-on-one interviews, industry news discussions, curated lunch conversations, and more. Plus, of course, we will have outstanding food and drink throughout the day, including an energizing closing reception. For more information and tickets, please go to allintheindustry.com. And also, please follow us at All Industry on Instagram and Twitter. I hope you will join us in celebrating our dynamic hospitality industry. Many thanks. Hey, are you hungry? Well, you're in luck. Meet and 3 is back for season 16. I'm Taylor Early, and we've got a whole new batch of reporters I am so excited to introduce you to. Hi, Hi there. I'm Elizabeth Fisher. Asha McElroy. Sam Girardi. Jessica Gingrich. Hannah from Wisconsin. I'm a swing dancing audio engineer. I am a future registered dietitian nutritionist. I'm from New York, and I love rice and beans. My favorite food of all time is a shrimp burrito. I love watermelon. We've also got a bonus podcast for you called Behind the Internship. Three of our reporters will take you along to show how they develop stories for this very show, Meet and Three. Hi, I'm Danielle Flitter, a plant-based chef from Philadelphia, living in Mexico City. I'm Sophia Hooper. I'm a bartender based in Portland, Maine. My name is Addison Austin Liu. I am a chef and food journalist from Salt Lake City, Utah, and my favorite food is Peruvian. Rice and beans. Hand-drawn noodle soup. So tune in to enjoy a square meal for your ears. And I hope you saved a little room for dessert.